Hello everyone, I'm Moonlight Graham, and welcome to the first episode of Covert and Classified. Today's classified episode is about a German secret weapon that killed 1,138 brave Allied soldiers in one devastating attack. The amount of lives lost from this attack stunned the Allies, and they took immediate action to cover it up. The secret weapon and the attack were immediately suppressed by the Allied leaders who were in agreement to classify it as top secret. Unfortunately, that decision by the War Department way back in 1943 would haunt and torture the loved ones and relatives of those brave souls who died that tragic day. This is the story of the hired military transport ship Rona and the German secret weapon that sunk her. Our story begins on November 26, 1943. The HMT Rona was headed towards India and loaded with just under 2,000 Allied troops. Their goal was to help in the China-Burma-Indian theater of the war against the Japanese Imperial Army. But that fateful trip was cut short when a German secret weapon unknown to the Allies was deployed from a German bomber causing the greatest loss of troops at sea by enemy action in U.S. history. The secret weapon struck fear and dread into the hearts and minds of the Allied leaders, as well as for all those that witnessed the horrible result of the secret weapon's destructive power. The aftermath and the decisions made by the Allied leaders were to hush up the incident and play it off as a regular bomb attack, the assumption being that such a weapon's existence being made known to the general public and Allied troops would lower morale and hurt the war effort against the Axis powers. 966 military personnel who survived or witnessed this tragic event were told by military leaders to stay quiet about what they saw and to never speak of it again under the threat of court-martial and imprisonment. The War Department immediately classified the incident indefinitely, making the story of the HMT Rona a very historic event for many reasons. I'll get into those reasons in just a moment, but first, Let's start at the beginning. The British India Steamship Company built the SS Rona as a combined passenger and cargo ship in the 1920s. Once the war broke out, the British government commanded it and renamed it HMT, which stands for His Majesty's Transport Ship or Hired Military Transport Ship. I've heard it called both ways. The Rona was painted black and pressed into service as a troop transfer ship that could carry as many as 2,000 very cramped soldiers. The conditions on the Rona were not ideal for the crowded and cramped troops. Rats and mice freely roamed the ship's decks and living conditions were hot, sweaty, and miserable. A far cry from the comfort the Rona used to offer passengers in its earlier days. The Rona and four other troop ships left Oran, French Algeria on Thanksgiving Day, 1943. Their destination was the Suez Canal. The Rona soon joined a convoy making its way from the UK to Alexandria, Egypt, Northeast Africa. As the ships passed through what was known back then as Suicide Alley, a dangerous Mediterranean sea strait known for German attacks, two dozen German Heinkel 177 bombers and fighter aircraft flying from occupied France with the sun behind them made their way towards the convoy. But the German enemy faced fierce opposition from the convoy's anti-aircraft guns. The convoy was also protected by the Free French Air Force and some British Spitfires. But despite the Allied coverage, it was minimal according to the classified reports as well as claims that the Rona was the only ship in the convoy without barrage balloons. A barrage balloon is a large unscrewed tethered balloon used to defend ground targets against air attack. Classified documents also state that there was no warning of enemy planes in the area and that there was poor communication between the ships in the convoy. As the battle raged on, miraculously the German Heinkel bombers and fighter escorts turned back towards occupied France without scoring any hits on the convoy. Sailors in the convoy began cheering as the enemy planes departed for not having made a single kill during the sudden attack. But what happened next was unexpected and shocking to all those who witnessed the events that transpired next. As one of the Heinkel bombers left the scene, an object flew out of the front of it and made a 90-degree turn in the air and bore down on the Rona. 
One of the surviving witnesses aboard the Rona looked out of his port window and watched in awe and fear as the object headed straight for his ship. He thought at first it was a pursuit aircraft with short stubby wings of some sort, and it was on fire. But as it turned out, it was an HS-293 radio-controlled glide bomb that could change direction and track its target at 500 miles an hour. Radio-operated, it was the forerunner to our present-day guided missiles. At the time, the Allies had no such technology. Stunned and confused, the witnesses to this strange object with fire coming out of the back of it watched in horror as it slammed into the Rona's side. When the glide bomb hit the side of the Rona, 300 American soldiers were instantly killed. As the Rona began to sink, the survivors quickly scrambled to the blood-soaked decks to get to the lifeboats. The M1926 inflatable life belts that were distributed to the soldiers as they boarded the ship were designed for amphibious assaults and not for naval ships. It was the closest thing to a life jacket that they had, but most of them did not know how to use the inflatable belts, and many sadly drowned due to this lack of training and knowledge. The next bad thing that happened was the realization that the winches that secured the lifeboats were rusted and inoperable. Many of the lifeboats could not be launched because of this tragic oversight. The few lifeboats that did launch were overflowing with survivors, and the frantic men jostled with each other to get onto the boats, which were way too few to seat them all. Scuffles broke out among the men over floating debris and whatever they could find floating nearby. A survivor described the chaotic scene as how he could see large blocks of men floating in the water as far as he could see. Many of these men would tragically drown, bringing the final death toll to 1,138 souls lost. Another horrible event occurred when one of the few boats that tried to rescue the men was battling rough ocean swells, causing its bow to rise up above the water and then slam back down into the water. Unfortunately, as this happened, many men were sadly crushed by the ship as it would rise up and land back down on the struggling survivors who were attempting to board the rescue ship. Even more tragic, the rest of the convoy had to continue on, lest they become targets of another German air attack. One of the Rona's survivors, who was able to use his inflatable belt to stay afloat, was not rescued till seven hours later by a British tugboat. Many of the others, though, would drown, and even more tragically, their bodies would not be recovered for more than six weeks later, while some were never recovered or seen again. Many questions remain as to why there wasn't more adequate air coverage for the convoy, and why rescue efforts were not more forthcoming, being that the tragedy happened just 15 miles off the coast of North Africa. As I mentioned earlier, the Rona attack was historic in many ways. Besides being the largest loss of troops at sea by a single enemy action in U.S. history, it was one of the first radio-guided missiles ever used against the U.S. The War Department swiftly classified the attack, ordering all of the survivors not to talk or write home about it under the threat of court-martial. By the time the war was over, most of the survivors went home with their painful story buried deep inside their memories as I tried to forget their secret tale of that fateful day. The War Department's decision to classify their own attack indefinitely kept the story out of the World War II history books. It was virtually never mentioned for 50 years. The families of those who were killed in the Rona attack were never told what happened to their loved ones. There were no War Department phone calls, letters, or visits made providing any information that would bring closure to the Gold Star families. And in case you don't know what a Gold Star family is, it is one that has experienced a loss of a loved one or an immediate family member who died as the result of military service. Those who died on duty leave behind parents, siblings, spouses, and children. Those left behind are recognized as Gold Star families. Most of the bodies of the soldiers were never recovered, and in most cases, there were no funeral services or burials for the forgotten soldiers. Six long months after the attack, the Gold Star families back home finally received one short paragraph confirming the death of their sons and husbands in a telegram that also stated that there was no other information available. That was it. The boys just never came home. 
While the War Department was holding back information about the Rona attack from the public, they were also misleading the thousands of family members, giving them false hope that their loved ones were still alive even though the War Department confirmed the casualties six months after the attack. All of the Gold Star families went through unnecessary pain and anguish from not knowing the truth about how their boys were killed. The stonewalling continued after the war was over as most of the Gold Star families went to their own graves never knowing anything about the Rona attack or how their hero died. The historic attack was left out of the history books and forgotten along with the men who were killed that day. The question to why the attack continued to be classified after the war was over is still largely unanswered. By the early 1990s, the War Department, now dubbed the Department of Defense, finally declassified the disaster and records became available to the public for the first time. Since the declassified records were made public, Rona survivors and relatives have created a Survivors Military Memorial Association where members meet in various cities almost every year since 1993. The HS-293 radio-controlled glide bomb, the then secret weapon that the Germans deployed that day, was just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what the Germans were devising in their laboratories. And many of these new war inventions were being designed and tested well before the war started in the late 1930s and towards the end of the war in 1945. Some of these Wunderwaffe, or wonder weapons as they were called, seemed like the stuff of science fiction or fantasy during that day and age. Thankfully, most of these Wunderwaffe never saw their completion due to the war ending in 1945, but their blueprints and legacy would continue on into the future designs of aircraft and rockets all over the world, most notably in the United States. So how did Germany in such a short time after World War I ended in 1918 go from being a humiliated and economically destroyed country to the world's leader in military and technological advancements over the rest of the entire world. And they did that in just 17 short years. It's a fair question, and one I would like to investigate. Join me in my next episode of Covert and Classified, where I will try to find out some of the answers to that head-scratching question. And lastly, I would also like to send my heartfelt condolences to all the Gold Star families, to all the witnesses, surviving members, and those who sadly died that day during the tragic sinking of the HMT Rona. I dedicate this video to you all. Thank you for your service and sacrifice. I'm Moonlight Graham, and I'll see you again on the next episode of Covert and Classified. Till next time.